My name is Brenda Lee, Contracting Officer. I want to thank all of you for attending and hope everyone will benefit from the information provided. Now I would like to introduce you to the Assistant Chief Procurement Officer, Damon McGuire. McClure, I'm sorry. <laughs> Good morning. That wasn't as exciting as I expected it. Good morning. Good morning. You know, we tried to bring in good weather for you to make sure your, your commute here and travel today was good. Thank you for being here today um, to our, and welcome to our pre-proposal conference for this, again, the single family supplemental claims process, business improvement process, and property disposition support services. I am Damon McClure, the Assistant Chief Procurement Officer for Program Support um, in the Contracting Office of OCPO. Today you'll hear about a requirement that we have here at HUD. As you know, we ensure approved lenders that issue mortgages under certain federal guidelines that we have. And when a borrower defaults on a loan, the mortgagee will file a claim with HUD as we are the insurers of the mortgagee, the, the person that lends the mortgage, issues the mortgage. So once that happens, HUD engages in the claims process, which also includes supplemental claims. And so to that end, we are looking to make our current process of paying claims, and which includes, and the focus, as you see, is supplemental claims, all the more better. And we're trying to improve the process. While we've been doing this for several years uh, and have that process down pat, we recognize that there are currently inefficiencies in our process that we're looking to prove and make better. So to that end, you will hear from our program representatives as well as our contracting representatives outlining our current process uh, articulating our goals going forward and what we're looking to do, as well as the requirements that we have via the solicitation to partner with us to make this process even better. Um, so just a bit of an overview. Uh, you'll have a presentation by our technical representatives first, uh, who will go through the various parts of our process and the goals that we're looking to achieve through this procurement. Uh, then we'll have our contracting staff come uh, behind them with a solicitation overview, walking you through some of the particular requirements we have to submit a proposal and, and for it to be considered and evaluated by HUD. And then we will have time for questions and answers. Um, and please recognize that we may not be able to answer all the questions today, uh, but certainly we will do our best. But all questions will be answered in writing via vid, uh, a posting to FedBiz Ops following this pre-proposal conference today. And so with that, I just ask that you take in the information. Please ask all of your questions to make sure you fully understand what we're looking for, um, and, see, and also to double check us to make sure we haven't missed anything. Um, and you know, enjoy yourselves today and, and, and avail yourselves of the information that's being provided today. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Sarah, Ms. Sarah Haywood. She is our contract specialist, and she will facilitate the rest of today's meeting. Again, thank you for being here. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. That's great. Thank you, Damon. Thank you, Brenda. Um, my name is Sarah Hayward, and um, I'm the contracting specialist for this project, and a lot of you I've already communicated with through email, and I'm very glad to see your face. We got snowed out in January, so we're ready to go now. I'm going to be your moderator for the rest of the uh, program, but I want to get a little of the logistics out of the way. Um, hopefully, everyone has received their name badges. Um, the bathroom, when you go out this door here to the left, the bathrooms are right there to, to the, uh, around the bend. If you want to go to LaFont during the break uh, to get coffee or anything, if you leave out the building, when you go out this door here, go to the right and go out the door where you see the security standing at. However, if you leave out that door, you can't come back through that door. You'll have to come back through the door that you processed in. Uh, number three, um, if you want to get coffee, we have Dunkin' Donuts on the third floor. However, we ask that you go in, go out as groups, so you will be escorted by one of the individuals that signed you in and registered you this morning. Because for security reasons, we can't have individuals roaming through the um, building un unescorted. So with that said, um, I'm going to um, explain the agenda. Um, Damon has went over some of the process. You will get a 15-minute break. 
Through each presentation, we ask that you hold your questions. Um, you were given an index card when you first came into the building. You could take those cards and write down your question. Those of, of the registers that are on webcast, you can send your um, questions through the Info Single Family where you registered at, and those questions will be read. All questions will be read, collected, and then the final answers will be posted out on FedBiz Ops. Um, we ask that during um, the break time that you please return promptly because we want to try to stick to the schedule. During the networking opportunity, you'll have an opportunity to network and speak with some of the panel members. I'm going to introduce the panel members that we have. First, I want to get to the rules of engagement. The government will consolidate all the written questions and they will be posted to the Fair Biz Op. And as was stated, the round of questions that you still may have after this conference, please post them to the information, single family information, no later than uh, two o'clock, March the 18th. Please adhere to that time because after that time, we will not be accepting any more questions. Please do not send the questions to my personal email box. Please make sure that they all go to the single family information. All communication after today shall be done through the contracting officer, Ms. Brenda Lee. Now I'm going to introduce our tech panels. We have Ms. Shauna Ford, Sean Ford. We have Ms. Jacqueline Joy. We have Ms. Kathleen Malone and Monica Christ Christopher. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm sorry. We have Ms. Deborah Gregory. I apologize, Deborah. <laughs> So we're going to open up the presentation with Ms. Sean Ford. She's going to give you an overview of the single family claims branch. Good morning, everyone. I'm going to take a few minutes just to give you a brief overview of our claims operation. Does this, which way do I point? Did it go, oh, it's not coming up here. Oh. The next. Okay. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Um, claims processing comes under the authority of the Federal Housing Administration. But what is the Federal Housing Administration? The Federal Housing Administration provides mortgage insurance on loans made by FHA-approved lenders. Now, one of the benefits of, housing of federal housing and mortgage insurance is that we provide lenders with protection against loss in the event of default the lender bears rest less risk because we will pay a claim for insurance benefits to the lender. We insure loans on single family, multifamily, manufactured housing, and hospitals. We are a self-sustaining operation. We operate entirely from, it's our self-generated income with no expense to taxpayers. This is done through the collection of the mortgage insurance premiums. Claims is located within the Single Family Post Insurance Division, which is located under the Housing FHA Comptroller. The Single Family Post Insurance Division is responsible for providing claim payment and asset-related services for FHA-insured single-family mortgages. We have two branches, the Single Family Claims Branch, which is responsible for review and approval of claim payments. And we also have the single family acquired assets management, I'm sorry, the single family acquired assets branch, which is responsible for asset acquisition, management, and disposition services of HUD's single family property inventory. We also have staff on our post insurance division office that is dedicated to our post-claim audit function, which is responsible for review and audit of paid single-family claims. Who do we serve? Here is a list of some of our internal and external clients. For example, we assist FHA-approved lenders with their claim issues, as well as the understanding of HUD policy and regulations, 
and we also assist the Department of Justice. We assist in litigation regarding mortgage fraud, um, just to name a few. Now these numbers represent the total dollar amounts of claims that we have paid for fiscal year 2014 and fiscal year 2015. Fiscal year 2014 is represented in blue and fiscal year 2015 is represented in red. For fiscal year 2014, we paid a total of $28.3 billion in claims. And for fiscal year 2015, we paid a total of $23.9 billion in claims. Sorry. Now this slide represents the total number of claims paid. For fiscal year 2014, we paid 595,000 claims. And in fiscal year 2015, we paid 481,000 claims. Now, please keep in mind that these two slides represent the total number of claims paid, not just supplemental claims. Now, here's a list of the claim types that we currently process. Our conveyance assignment, claims without conveyance and title, and pre-foreclosure claims are considered our disposition claims. Lenders can dispose of the loans through deeding title of the property to HUD, assigning the loan to HUD, through third-party purchase, or if the mortgagor meets the qualifications for a short sale. Now, the inventory for supplemental claims under this contract comes from these four claim types. We also offer loss mitigation, which is our special forbearance, loan modification, and our HAMP programs. Loss mitigation allows lenders to provide assistance to homeowners that are having difficulty with their mortgage. These options assist the homeowner in retaining their residence. The options available allow homeowners to temporarily suspend, reduce their mortgage payments, modify the terms of their mortgage, or permanently reduce their mortgage payment through the use of a partial claim. We also offer um, reconveyance claims. The reconveyance occurs when the lender conveys the title of the property to HUD, and for whatever reason, whether it be defective title or property damage, HUD will deed the property back to the lender. The lender can cure the default and then reconvey title back to HUD, and that is when they will file their reconveyance claim. We also offer the home equity conversion mortgage, which is our reverse mortgage. Um, that program allows homeowners age 62 or over that own their home outright to borrow against the equity in their home. Lenders dispose of these loans through either a demand assignment, foreclosure, deed in lieu, short sale, or short sale to, um, for the property. Now, how are claims received and processed? Claims are received via EDI or electronic data interchange, FHA connection, or paper claim submission. When the claims are received, they are submitted through, they come through our A43C system, which is our system of record for all of our claims. This system holds all of our claim information when they're received, when claims are paid, when claims are deleted, all of that information. Once the claims are submitted, they are put into batches and those batches are then released the following business day. Now, once those batches are released, the claims go through, they are checked against our predetermined edits. The claims that pass all of those predetermined edits are automatically paid. Any claim that, that fails one or more edits is suspended in our system. The lender then has 60 days to either 
fix the, fix the problem or send us the information so that we may pay their claim. Approximately 80% of our claims are paid through the system while the other 20% are suspended and await the um, lender to correct the claim or for one of our review and compliance specialists to review and pay the claim. And that is our current claims process. Thank you. Thank you, Sean, for that overview of uh, single family claims background and processes. Ms. Um, Ford is the management analyst. Next that we'll be presenting, we will have Ms. Jacqueline Roy. She's the financial review and compliance specialist, and she's going to provide you an overview of the single family claims, oh, um, I'm sorry, single family supplemental claims overview. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm gonna to present to you what is a supplemental claim. A supplemental claim is filed after the initial claim has been settled. The purpose of filing a supplemental claim is to request an adjustment to the initial claim in the event of delayed disbursement or to correct errors on the initial claim submission. How are supplemental claims processed? Supplemental claims are processed via, all supplemental claims are received via um, paper submission. Supplemental claims must be received within six months of initial claim settlement. We review 100% of all supplemental claims are reviewed. How are they processed? Supplemental claims previously submitted and returned to the mortgagee for correction and or further inf information must be received by the department as soon as possible, but no later than 45 days from the department's request. Any subsequent supplemental claims submitted for the same case will be denied unless it meets one of the following exceptions. Approval to file the additional supplemental claim is granted by the single family claims branch chief. The subsequent supplemental claim concerns hazard insurance adjustments or additional unpaid principal balance. No filing approval is necessary. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Jacqueline, for that overview. Next, we will have Ms. Deborah Gregory. She's the Chief Financial Operation and Control Section, and she will provide you an overview of the single family supplemental claim current process. Good morning. Good morning. I'm gonna speak with you today regarding the on-site work that is performed by the on-site contractor. I'm gonna speak about a few functions that are performed by the on-site contractor. Every day we have schedules that are dispersed from financial operation control section. Oops, sorry. We have three types of schedules to disperse. The first one that I'm gonna speak about is the Treasury Disbursement Statistic Report, the short name version, AX2. All forward claims that are submitted through FHA connection and electronic data interchange are paid through the AX2 schedule. The on-site contractor prepares the AX2 schedule for disbursement daily. Once completed, the information is forwarded to the cash management branch for disbursement. As Sean mentioned earlier, through this process, 80% of claims are paid. The second type of schedule is the Home Equity Reverse Mortgage Information Technology, short name Hermit. The on-site contractor will extract all HECM claims approved for payment. They will prepare the disbursement transmittal form and get the certifier to, to verify and approve the payment. The on-site contractor will email the Hermit schedule to the cash management branch for disbursement. The final type of schedule is a manual payment. Single family claims subsystem A43C cannot pay claims twice. 
Therefore, we have a manual process of paying claims. We have several reasons for creating a manual payment. Duplicate payment, which means that the lender sends in a payment twice, so therefore we're gonna refund the payment back out to the lender. A overpayment, oh, the lender paid too much, so we send the, the funds back that is not due to HUD. Then lender pays the funds after a claim offset. Um, our system automatically will, when we re set up a receivable, our system, after so many days, will offset a claim from a claim that comes in for a payment. Sometimes the lender will send the funds in after the claim, after the payment has been paid through offset, so we will refund that payment. Manual payments are received by a financial operation control staff person for verification and signature. The staff person will provide the schedule to the on-site contractor for processing. Once completed, the schedule is emailed to cash management branch for disbursement. And the file maintenance is the last thing I'm gonna speak about. Well, not the last thing I'm gonna speak about. The on-site contractor will just maintain all documents that are pro produced by the schedules in chronological order. The next thing I'm gonna speak about is our current process for supplemental claims. To combine the current functions perform under three separate contracts into one comprehensive contract. This, this will streamline the entire supplemental claim process to make it more efficient, secured, and risk-based. Okay, as you see, Contractor A comes to HUD in the morning to pick up from single family claims branch and the post office. They return to their facility to conduct review of the mail. They batch the supplemental claims in groups of 20 and return to HUD the next business day. Contractor B picks the batches of supplemental claims and return to their facility. They image and upload the file to A43. They return the batches to HUD on the next business day. I keep forgetting to click this. <laughs> okay. Contractor C picks up the supplemental claims to organize and inventory the supplemental claims. They will return to HUD the next business day for contractor A to pick up the supplemental claims to review and make recommendations to the approve to approve for payment or deny. The next business day, those claims will be will be returned to HUD. Contractor C picks up those claims, takes them back to their facility to input the recommendations into A43C system. The next day, business day, those claims are returned back to HUD. Contractor A picks up the supplemental claims to prepare them for file retention. To summarize the current supplemental claims process, to process supplemental claims requires three contractors, travel distance of 70 miles, six days of transit, and it doesn't include time frame for claim review, and an increased risk of misplaced lost claims, personal information being exposed. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you, Deborah, for providing the current overview of how we are doing our processes now. So just imagine you are here trying to figure out how can I do that a whole lot better, okay? <laughs> With that said, we have Ms. Kathleen Malone. She's the Director, Office of Financial Services. She's gonna to explain to you and provide an overview of the business process improvement. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for being here. I'd like to make a few other introductions, if that's okay. Uh, Jason is the author of the sort of flow chart that you just saw, uh, sort of a compelling argument for why we all are here today. Arvel Howerton 
want to stand up, is our single family claims branch um, manager, branch chief. And is Mark, yeah, Mark, single family acquired assets branch is in the back. So obviously we are anxious to uh, get busy on improving the process that you were just um, given a briefing on. Our goals here, again, in addition to consolidating the contract into one, also include you know, improving our customer service. Obviously, if we improve the process, we will be able to um, improve our, our customer service to the list of customers that, that Sean, I think, uh, introduced you to. We really are intent on leaving this manual process, uh, obviously an inefficient manual process, uh, to a paperless, risk-based approach to doing our work here. Uh, it'll help us manage our operations, avoid backlogs, avoid bottlenecks, which we sometimes happen because of the you know, various entities involved in this. And obviously security is something that uh, we are increasingly uh, concerned about. So that's what we really want to do in, a, in addition to consolidating the three contracts into one. As you know, our team members gave you some clues. Currently, we do a 100% review of our supplemental claims. Again, it's a paper process. Um, and so we really are looking forward to this business process improvement. Um, I hope you were impressed by you know, the many opportunities there are to improve the current sort of loops around the beltway that, that, are, that are done, as well as um, a very paper intensive effort. Um, I think another clue is again, we do a 100% review on our uh, other claim types. We, we do an 80% automatic pay. Now that's obviously a very deliberate decision making using our system and, and we identify parameters. And then we also have a post claim review that we do to just to validate that process and to identify you know, any uh, mistakes or adjustments that need to be made to our parameters. So that's our major control uh, for that 80% automatic pay. Um, Again, we, we are hoping to, to improve uh, our responsibility with personal information that, that is on these paper documents and eliminate you know, uh, many of the steps to provide a faster, more efficient service to our customers this, you know, that, that, that submit these uh, claims, supplemental claims. I think I've covered it. I haven't moved the slides forward, have I? Sorry. <laughs> And with that having been said, uh, Monica, would you like to uh, discuss our single family acquired assets requirements? Thank you all very much. We appreciate your being here today. See how excited Kathleen is to have you guys here today. Okay, with that said, we're going to have Ms. Monica Christopher. She's our government technical monitor, and she was going to provide you an overview of the SAM support services. Good morning. The tasks involved with the SAM support services include completing payee file maintenance, staffing a customer service help desk, conducting an internal audit, and providing operational and internal control procedures. The specific, I always forget this whole thing. The specific task involved with payee file maintenance include activating, reactivating, Mo or modifying payee name and address identifiers, what is known as NADES, by entering vendor, da vendor data from approved applications into our single family acquired asset management system, commonly known as SAMS. Performing internal review, I'm sorry, internal revenue service tax identification, number matching, keying in electronic funds transfer enrollment data, 
for said vendors, linking and delinking homeownership center areas to those NAIDs, reviewing all payee ma file maintenance forms and verifying accuracy prior to data entry. And hopefully this goes without saying, but all data entry requires 100% accuracy since we're dealing with, with vendor EIN and SSN data. What is a, a NAID? A NAID is a single family acquired asset management system generated 10 digit, oh, 10 digit identifier assigned to all payees. It includes real estate brokers, property managers, homeowner associations, government trade service vendors. NAID applications are approved by homeownership centers, the ho by the homeownership center and contractors within the homeownership center. NAIDs are created by SAMs automatically using an algorithm based on the vendor's name and tax identification number, such as you see here Long and Foster, nine digit EIN, and their NAID, um, the first six digits include, uh, include their name, the last four digits are the end of their, their EIN. The number of NAIDs we currently have in SAMs are almost 100,000, if not a little bit over today. NAIDs identify real estate brokers, which is our biggest number at over 90,000, on the HUD standard sales contracts for our REO properties and all other vendors on disbursement invoices. Based on their earnings per calendar year, we issue a form miscellaneous 1099 that is uh, printed and mailed by a separate entity. Now, customer service help desk. The primary focus of this operation is to provide technical assistance to customers on all required tasks under payee file maintenance and shall be staffed by at least one customer service representative between the hours of 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. At a minimum, the customer service representative shall be knowledgeable, courteous, thorough, and prompt. And as this function is considered to be extremely important, it is imperative that highly qualified staff perform these duties. internal audits. On an annual basis, the contractor shall conduct its own internal control review of all payee file maintenance related tasks performed under this contract, and a written report detailing the results of the review shall be submitted to the government technical monitor and the government technical representative. The final task is operating in internal control procedures. The contractor shall provide the government technical representative with, the, with written operating and internal control procedures and a quality control plan relating to the processing of payee file maintenance and all other activities established and required under this order within 30 days of the effective date. The contractor shall update procedures as necessary and provide, all copy, pro provide a copy of all updates to the GTR. And that is the end of the SAMS task. Thank you. Thank you, Monica, for providing the SAM support services overview. It appears that we're moving along a little swiftly today, so we're going to make a little adjustment. And in the end, it will give you more of an opportunity to network and to ask questions. You're still going to get the break, but because I think I believe it's about 930 now, um, we're going to um, move up the overview of the solicitation because that is really the meat and potatoes, and we really want you to understand everything about the solicitation. Um, remember the cards that you have. You can write your questions down. And if I could get two of my registers to please stand. 
these two ladies could come around and pick up your cards, and we will read the questions and response during the Q&A, and Ms. Brenda Lee will become a part of the panel that will also answer your questions on the Q&A. Just give me one minute. Okay, I'm going to start out with the um, rules of engagement, and I respectfully ask that if you have pads and pens and pencils to please follow along, especially when Brenda get into um, the, how the award is, I'm sorry, I already awarded it already, how you're going to be evaluated. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, we're going to start out um, with the classification. This is considered unclassified, but um, you know that the government will protect um, any unauthorized release of any information that you provide. Also, it's the pre-proposal uh, conference here. It's just an exchange of information only. Uh, we're not here to um, discuss capabilities and different things like that. This is for information purposes. Also is to provide you an oversight into um, HUD's technical needs and the solicitation requirements. And I must state that this is very important because oftentimes uh, we may get, not this, particularly this one, we may get in proposals that really the contractor, the vendor, or the subcontractor, or whoever, did not fully understand the requirements of the solicitation. So that would be your opportunity because it's currently out and I believe it closes April 1st. Um, make sure that you understand what the requirements are. If you don't, please send in your questions so that you can get clarification before putting your package together. Because you do want a package put together that where you will be the successful winner. There will be no one-on-one -on -one discussions. There will only be follow-up comments and questions allowed. Please, I will reiterate this, read the solicitation. As you know, the solicitation has already, oh, I'm sorry, the solicitation is already out there and it's D100R16. R0001. The contract type is a fixed price contact, and we have a period of a base of 12 months and four option years. This is restricted to a total small business set aside. The next code is 541211 Office of Certified Public Accountants. The standard size is 20.5 mil. The product description is R710 Financial Services, and this is a performance based acquisition. Okay, we're gonna say, we're putting it out here, you tell us, government, this is how we're going to do this. Not um, some way, government, what do you want us to do? We want you to put a, forth your best and your brightest when you put your teams together. The surveillance method, it has 100% random sampling will be for the inspections for the reports. Um, the other inspections will be on the um, claims. The transition period will be 30 days, and then you have a 30-day transition out period. The place of performance will be the contractor's facility. Okay, the key thing, I'm not going to read everything to you, but the key things is that I want you to understand from this part of the slide is to establish the acceptable minimum requirement for the format and the content of your proposal. Please pay attention to the directions that are outlined in the solicitation. Again, if you do not understand, we'd rather you come in and ask the questions for clarification than put together a package that may not be the best that you can do. It's going to be a single award, and the government anticipate awarding to one successful offer. And guess who the successful offer is going to be? The one who reads the solicitation, put the requirements together, and able to perform the responsibilities of the contract. If an offer does not follow instructions, the offer may be eliminated. And that's why I'm, I keep reiterating and saying this over and over again, because that is important. Do not put yourself in a status 
get clarity, ask questions, period. The next part we will go over is the, is the completion of the re, uh, representations and certifications. That's all gonna be found in your section five. The essence of this other number, bullet number four, the contracting officer cannot and will not independently obtain information necessary to evaluate the offer's proposal. So that means that you should supply everything in your completed package that is being asked of you in the solicitation. And most important, make sure that your offers are timely. We will not be evaluating or accepting offers that come in after the time of cutoff. Proposals are gonna be um, submitted in two parts. You're gonna have your technical, which we will find under volume one, and your pricing will be found under volume two. Each part must be completed in itself. That means don't intertwine them together and we have to try to figure out which direction you were going in. Instructions to offer. Please pay attention to this area too. This is your opportunity to set clarity. This is also how you're going to, to communicate. You're going to communicate with the contracting officer. If you send any emails to Sarah Hayward, I'm just going to forward it to the contracting officer. But your um, questions and concern will be followed up with an answer. Also in bullet number seven, we give you penalties of making false statements to the government and that's prescribed in our US code 181001. Number, bullet number eight, what I want you to take away from that is make sure you sign your standard form 1449, submit submission of proposal, fixed price line items are required to be submitted in an Excel and PDF. Please do not get creative in this area because there's a reason these requirements are put in the solicitation. The introduction to the offer. What I want you to take away for your subcontractors, offers must provide a commitment letter from the subcontractor that you're dealing with. The uh, bullets here outline what must be, I'm sorry. Okay, the bullets here outline what must be included in there, which the essence you're gonna walk away is the list of duties. How is the prior, you're gonna prioritize and how is the work related to other work. Also, a complete price proposal in the same format as the offer's price proposal is not independent of itself. Also, the prime contractor must do at least 50% of the work in accordance with FAR Clause 52.219-14, limitation on subcontracting. Make sure that you are in compliance. And I keep saying things, do not eliminate yourself. Offers who propose to perform more than 50% of the total cost of labor with the prime contractor will be considered acceptable. And then they will be evaluated under other factors. So to sum up that main point is, make sure you read and follow all instructions outlined in the solicitation to the letter. Now I'm going to have Ms. Brenda Lee is going to go forward with the rest of the solicitation starting with instructions to offer. Ms. Brenda Lee. Hello again. Let's see. Okay, I'm gonna begin with um, the instruction, well, I'm gonna complete the instructions to the offerers. Proposals due date is April 1st, 2016, by two, by two o'clock p.m. I'm gonna go over the evaluation factors and give you some lessons learned that I find when I evaluate a proposal. The first one is technical approach. Uh, if you notice, we have the factors are technical approach, management plan, key personnel, and past performance. 
the government will make award on a trade-off. That means that not the lowest price, but other than the, than the, high, the lowest price can be the successful offer. It's going to be on a trade-off value. If you offer us something that is worth the money, then we can do a trade-off and award to that particular vendor. See, I'm gonna go on to the tactical uh, factors. Under the technical, I'm gonna go by each factor. Technical approach. When you write your the, there are going to be some revisions, and it'll probably be posted mid -net next week to the PWS and to the, and to the uh, solicitation. So there are going to, so I'm going to go over those changes as well. Under the technical approach, there is a 15-page limit. We're going to ask for tasks one through six and tasks under section, under supplemental claims, and section two under SAM's support services. Now, the technical approach is a minimum page of 35 pages. So if you are, when you write your narrative, if you miss anything like, say, for example, supplemental claims tasks one through six. If you do one and three, then you miss two. So that's a deficiency. I asked you for something and you didn't provide it. So in anything in the solicitation, when I ask you for something and you don't provide it, that's a, that's a uh, deficiency. A deficiency, when you have a deficiency, that makes you unacceptable. That means you're not eligible for award, depending on how the remaining part of your award go, if, if it's meaningful to really go into discussions. But some of the tips, when you write your narrative, don't write and say, we can, we can do this or we are going to do this. You need to tell me how you're going to do it. This is a performance work statement. And we provide you the outcome. You are the one that tell us how we're going to do it. So those are just my uh, comments in the technical uh, discussion. And the same way in the management plan, there's a 25-page limit. If you miss anything by giving the key personnel and their responsibilities, the staffing plan, uh, the proposed subcontracting arrangement. If you miss any of that, it's a deficiency, because I asked for it, and you didn't give it to me. A significant weakness is something, if I, you ask for, if we ask for something and it's just no way that you, that means that you pretty don't have an understanding of the requirement. So it's very, this is, and, and the factors are in descending order of importance. That means the first factor is the most important. The second factor is the next in line, and the third and so forth. So you're gonna get the most weight on the first factor. I want to go over key personnel. There were some questions that we had addressed uh, about the key personnel. We asked for them to be certified or a PCPM, one or the other. Both one, the same for the project manager 
and the same for the alternate. You need to make sure that their resumes meet the requirements that are stated in the solicitation. If we said at least five years, then you don't give me something with somebody got four years because that's a weakness. You need to make sure the person meets the requirement. And the same go for the subject matter expert. Because we have three, asked for three key personnels. And those three key, key personnels have to sign letters of commitment. I get solicitations, and I don't even have the signed letter of commitment. So if you don't give it to me, that's a deficiency. And then we go into the past performance. Past performance, I, you have a chart that you're supposed to list all your, your past performance on. OK, those past performance must match in the chart, must match the relevancy of the requirement. So the past performance chart must have a reference from an outsider that you sent the past performance survey to, and they're supposed to sit and send that to the contracting officer. That has to be submitted before proposal due date. And we're going to evaluate past performance on recency. So if they haven't, the work is not current or hasn't been done in the past three years, recency, we're just going to knock that out. So it's very important that you send your past performance surveys out so we can get them on time. And it's very important that you match those in the chart. Now, if you have, if you're a current contract of HUD and it's in PEEPERS, then you are not required to uh, get a past performance. Okay. The next thing I want to discuss is the mitigation, the conflict of interest. If you have a potential conflict of interest, if you are a lender, mortgagee, submit claims to HUD, then you're forbidden to bid on this because we can't have you paying your own claims. That's a conflict of interest. <laughs> Sometimes you find that. <laughs> and it's not a part of the evaluation but if you do have a conflict of interest, you need to submit a mitigation plan telling us how you plan to um, perform the contract and keep these things separately. And it will be reviewed during your uh, determination of responsibility. Okay. Okay, let's see, where am I? The next part I want to go to is the pricing. The line items are in the solicitation. However, we deleted the pricing sheet because it was a duplicate of the 1449, and that's why we deleted it. So I'm going to go over the pricing the sample price and uh, uh, um, the sample pricing sheet.
Now this is just, I only just put this up there for the base. So the post award, that's one lot. Mailing, that's a monthly charge for line two. Claim and in imaging, that's not to exceed 400,000 pages per year. So when you go to your base and your option one, two, three, four, it's going to be 400,000. That's the, it's not to see because we always have to fund the minimum. The business process, that's for three years. We expect the business process improvement to be completed within three years. And the other two years is just maintaining. I mean, that clan strictly goes away. So the business process, we would like the business process, is that correct, Sean? Yes. We like the business process to be completed within three years. We go to the risk-based supplemental claims processing. Tier one, greater than or equal to 2,500. We will only evaluate tier one. Because usually what happens, the more you do, the less the price. So we're going to evaluate tier one only when we do our price analysis and so forth on uh, CLIN 8. One is supplemental and the other one is manual processing. And these quantities are maximums that you would do when the tw it says 12 months, like we have SAMS processing. That's a minimum of 500 per month. Now, I didn't print out all the, uh, my sample sheets, but the last year, the fourth year, has a transition out. We have a transition in that's 30 days after the PIP process. And the fourth year, we have a 30-day transition plan at the end of the year. And I think that transition is due what is 60 or 90 days? 60 or 90, transition plan is due 90 days before contract expiration. So a lot of vendors don't, don't really pay any attention to it. I also ask for the pricing to be submitted on an Excel spreadsheet. And the PDF is, is so it's set, you know, PDF is for your knowledge, but I want to be able to evaluate it and verify the price. Now, I noticed that a lot of vendors do not total out their option, their base year and option prices. I would like to see that. That way I can make sure that your prices are correct. When you do your pricing. I ask for other than cost and pricing data. That is a cost breakdown of how you came up with your bottom line price. Now, preferably that can be that should be on an Excel spreadsheet. Because that's the only way that I can determine how you came up with your price. I have to determine unbalanced pricing. If you got a clan that's 25,000 and another one is 2,000, I mean, if they're unbalanced, you know, you can be rejected as well. When you do your subcontracting, the proposal should address the limit, as Sarah said, the limitation of subcontracting. Well, which I need to identify that you're doing 50%. And this is labor costs. This is not materials or anything. This is labor. 
The limitation of subcontracting applies to the applies to labor. So I when you do your cost breakdown, I need to see your labor rate. And in the section in the price in there under it says cost and pricing and other and then cost and pricing. For some reason, the FAR has consolidated the two. And it identifies exactly on what I'm asking. It says labor rates, hours cost any materials that it costs you to come up with the bottom line price. Some people, some questions was, why am I asking for other than cost and price and data? And they say I can't do that, but if you check the FAR, I can. Because I need to know how you came up with that bottom line price, that line item, and it is required. If you're not in compliance with the uh, solicitation, your solicitation can be rejected. It states that the labor categories, number of hours, labor rates, percentage of effort, and labor mix, and any other cost that may apply to the total cost of each contract line item. And options will be evaluated as well um, in accordance with FAR 212-3. Um, they will be evaluated. Like, we, I see proposals that are forward pricing or they have maybe they put all the money up front and then leave all the money back. Well, there's no guarantee that those options are going to be exercised. So I suggest you do your best effort and give me your best proposal the first time. And to let you know that when we evaluate it, anything you miss or anything that you don't address or if you write something that says, we can do this, it's a deficiency. And it's not, uh, it's not gonna move forward. So, with that said, I'm going to, I believe I covered everything. Um, options of price and sheep. So I think I covered everything. And uh, if you have any questions, um, we'll go through them in the Q&A sessions. Sarah? OK, thank you, Brenda. I'm going to try to wrap it up. Before we go to the break, I got a couple of minutes. I want you to have these few takeaways from what Ms. Lee just presented to you. Review all applicable schedules, clauses, and attachments. Align your proposal with the government's need and articulate what makes you the best solution. That's what we're looking for. Respond as you're, answer, respond as you're answering all questions. Eliminate any guesswork. Response should be applicable, identified, so the uh, reviewer that is reviewing your proposal do not have to guess what you're, where you're going. How does your company clearly articulate how to solve the problem? Fill the need that's going to be outlined in the solicitation. Do not tell a story about your company. What really matters is substantiating how you can do the specific work that is needed. Make sure your expectations meet the reality of the requirements. So that means to prepare, align, and execute. With that said, we will now take our break, and we will return back at 10.30.
If anyone needs to go to the third floor, please let us know so we can escort you to the third floor, because there's a Dunkin' Donuts up there where they have coffee. And the bathrooms are off to the left.
Hello, everyone in attendance and to the vendors who are watching by webcast, um, welcome back. And this is now the beginning of our Q&A section. And after that, we will have the networking. Um, what I want to make sure that is understood up front, that the um, questions that you submitted today, all of them may not be answered at this given moment in time, but all responses will be posted to FedBizOps. Secondly, and most important, whatever responses you receive today does not govern what the requirements of the solicitations are. It is what is put in writing and posted by the federal government. Thank you. I'm going to begin with some of the questions. Um, all of your questions may not be um, in the stack that I have at this moment, but I assure you no one's questions will go unanswered. They will just be posted because some questions require more review. I will begin with, I can't read with my glasses. I will begin with question number one. There are three, contra I'm sorry. We did have some new contractors that came in. I'm going to introduce our panel. To my left, we have Ms. Brenda Lee. She is the contracting officer. We have Ms. Monica Christopher. I always get her name mixed up. She is the government contract technical monitor. We have Ms. Kathleen Malone. To my left, she is the Director, Office of Financial Services. And beside her, we have Ms. Deborah Gregory. She is the Chief Financial Operation and Control Section. And then to Ms. Um, Gregory's right, we have Ms. Jo Jacqueline Roy. She is the Financial Review and Compliance Special. And to my left, we have Ms. Sean Ford. She's the Management Analyst. This is your panel that will be answering your questions today. So let's begin with question number one. Um, there are three contractors currently doing the single family claims reviews and the other services. Are, are these three, okay, are these three firms allowed to bid this op on this opportunity? Panel? As long as they, yes, they can, as long as they are a small business. Okay, thank you. So the answer is yes, as long as you're a small business. Question number two, does the contracting, does the contractor's office have to be within a certain vicinity of the HUD office? No. The answer is no. <laughs> Okay, I will continue to move on. Okay, please confirm that a qualified small business prime can bid with a large business subcontractor doing less than 50% of the work slash labor. Yes. Yes is the answer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, please release a copy of the slides presented today. Please release an audio video recording of today's conference. The slides will be posted probably mid next week and the first set of Q and A's as well as as soon as we get this back from broadcast, we will post this conference on YouTube, and you can watch it again. Okay, thank you, Ms. Lee. Our next question is, please provide a minimum of a two-week extension to the proposal due date to facilitate, <laughs> to facilitate teaming following this conference and sufficient time to react to the upcoming PWS changes. The solicitation due, re due date remains the same. However, we will review it at that time. Okay. Next question. Please release a list of the attendees, their company's names and point of contact information. Damon, you want to answer that? <laughs> it will be posted with the Q&As in the uh, fourth time in amendment. Okay. okay, next question. If the contractor is able to provide a graduated 
tiered approach to a paperless process before the third year, will HUD be ready to review documents online in a sooner time frame? That question cannot be answered at this time. It will be posted on FedBizOp. Could you describe the past performance requirements for current HUD contractors? I'll read it again. Could you describe the past performance requirements for current HUD contractors? If you have a reference in papers, you do not need to submit a past performance survey. Next question. Will you post, I'm sorry. One point of clarification, and I'm looking to Brenda on that. For the current contractors, as long as you have completed the past performance, that's what she means by the people's record. That is something that is completed. If it is ongoing, then it will not be considered because obviously it's not completed yet so that we can't give the reference to. I believe this question has already been asked, answered, but I'll read it again. Will you post list of attendees and company information? Yes. The answer was yes. Okay, next question. Is the contracting officer anticipating oral presentation as part of the evaluation process? There will be no oral presentations. Okay, no oral presentation. Next question. Will the PowerPoint presentation be distributed to all attendees? That question has already been answered also. It'll be posted. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna try this. Okay, subcontractors have a requirement to provide at least one relevant past performance. I believe that's what their question is. I'm not sure. Is that the question? I'll read it again. Uh, subcontractors have a requirement to provide at least one relevant past performance, and that is the question. The answer is, if the subcontractor is going to provide more than 20% of the work, they need to, to comply with the same as the prime, which means that they have to do five performance references and the prime does five. It's right there in the solicitation. Okay, thank you. Next question. Please confirm that relevant past performance will be evaluated on a par with the incumbent's past performance. This will ensure maximum competition and avoid an unfair advantage for encumbered contractors. I'll read it again. Please confirm that relevant past performance will be evaluated on a par with the encumbered's past performance. This will ensure maximum competition and avoid an unfair advantage for encumbered contractors. I'll look at that again, but we have to do, we, the solicitation state we evaluate on recency first. If, if you haven't performed the work within the last three years or have similar experience, then that's it. Then we go to the next one, which is relevancy. Again, a more detailed response to that specific question will be posted. Next question. For the business process improvement tasking, is the contractor responsible for implementation of proposed process improvement? An example is implement implementation of new systems, AP, APIs, et cetera. I'll read it again. For the business process improvement task, is the contractor responsible for implementation of proposed process improvement? For example, implementation of new systems, APIs, etc. Yes, we do expect that the business process improvements are implemented um, as part of the contract requirements, part of the to meet the government's need. 
I'm not sure. APIs, I don't know what that is. I'm not sure. This question, we will give you a, a more detailed response and it will be posted. Yes, thank you. Next question. It's similar, but it's worded a little different. Um, if contractor is a current HUD contractor, should contractor submit a past performance reference for current work? If a contractor is a current HUD contractor, should contractor submit a past, performant ref past performance reference for the current work, the current work they're currently performing on? Yes, again, uh, to, to follow up to Brenda's answer earlier, if you have a current records and peepers that covers the current work, we will use that. But if you do not have a current peepers record, then yes, you will need to submit that and follow the rules and regulations of the solicitation regarding past performance. Okay. As stated previously, any responses to the questions that we give today are not legally binding unless it's in writing. Next question, was the final RIF released on what date? So they mean the RFP. The uh, yeah, oh, I'm sorry. Was the final RFP released and on what date? Released that. Okay, the final RFP. First, we issued a draft solicitation. That draft is no longer valid. It was just a draft. We issued the, the RFP on, when was it? I believe it was Se February 17th. February 17th, 18th, like that. However, I will be a, a, doing an amendment this week. So ensure that you read it. And just to um, piggyback off Ms. Lee, make sure when you go out on FedBizOps, you're looking at the most current update. Make sure when you click on that button and bring something up that you're looking at the date in the present, not dated in the back, especially because I know the draft could be a little confusing for some people. Second part of the question is, can option year pricing blend new improvements with current processes? Can option year pricing blend new improvement with current processes? I don't think they can hear you. <laughs> yes, is the answer. Okay, thank you. Please verify whether the government is open to a completely paperless process for supplemental claims. Please. <laughs> That's why we're looking for the best of the best. <laughs> okay, next question. Is the mail received at the off-site, uh, I think that means total, uh, I'm not sure what that says. Okay, I'll, I'll guess that if I'm incorrect, I apologize. Is the mail received at the off-site, uh, facility or something filtered through HUD. I'm not sure what the other word is. So I guess that they're asking if the mail off, on the offsite is being filtered through HUD. Or is it totally filtered? I'm not sure about that question. We don't open the mail. The mail right, will be opened at the facility. So no, we don't do an, a review or a sorting or an overview. Hope that answers the question. Okay, we'll look at that question a, a little further. Is there something here? Okay. The new contract we expect for the mail to be sent to the contractor, not to come to HUD. I'm not sure. If, okay. If that the second part of the question is, on average, how many pieces of mail is processed? at the off-site facility on a daily basis? I can answer this question monthly. It's approximately 2,000 pieces of mail. Okay, next question. What is the anticipated 
call volume for um, call center support. What is the anticipated call volume for call center support? I'm assuming this is for the SAMS servicing. Um, right now, the incoming and outgoing help center is about 50 calls, emails um, a month. Okay, another, this is in the second part of that question. How many records are expected for scanning, uploading, et cetera? We expect no more than 400,000 pieces, pages, <laughs> a year. <laughs> okay, next part of this question is, who, prov who provides hosting for scanned documents? The current contractor will house the scanned documents because once they're scanned, and upload it, they will go to the next group of people that's in the current contract to make recommendations, review, analyze, and make recommendations. So they will stay there at the current contractor site. And the last part of this particular question is, is the contractor responsible for postage? No. Okay. Okay, next question. What percentage of work is on-site versus off-site? 90% is off-site, 10% is on-site. Okay. Next question. Does CLIN 2 for mail processing include postage for correspondence outside of HUD? Let me clarify this. The mail comes to HUD there's no postage involved. The only postage that is involved is when we return to mortgagees, and that's paid by HUD. Okay. Next question. Will contractors deliver records directly to NARA, N-A-R-A, for archive, archive? The current process, oops, oh, did you go? Oh. We have a records management branch, well, records management division in the building, and our current process is for that section to come to your office to review the boxes prior to going to the records management, the, to the records center. Okay. At the archives, yes. Okay, next question. Is the transition in plan included with technical volume page count? I'll read the question again. Is the transition in plan included with technical volume page count? Mr. McClure states the answer is yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, I don't know what's the X in this. Okay. There are classifications excluding or comparable to the PMI, et cetera. Okay. Got it. I know. I know what this question means. The contractor is asking, there are, are, are certifications. Uh, exceeding or comparable to the um, PMP, PMI, et cetera, like um, Harvard Executive Management um, Recognition Program, are they acceptable substitutes? We're gonna have to answer that question later. That question will have to be reviewed and you will get a response later and it will be posted. Next question, how many claims are received by electronic submission versus paper submission? Supplemental claims are not received electronically, they're all paper. The electronic submission is for the initial claim only. Okay. What are the current staffing levels, FTEs, for the three incumbent contracts? It's approximately 30 for all three contractors. 
Next question. Does contractors, oh, does a contractor have to have a bona fide office in DC? No. Okay. <laughs> Is there any physical distance requirements? I'm not sure what that, oh, between HUD, mail location box? Okay. Is there any physical distance requirement between HUD, uh, emits, I think this says mail slash location box? No. Okay. And contractor's warehouse? No. Now let me read that again. I don't know. It's no, no distance. Nothing in there like that. Okay, that question will be reviewed. So just to clarify, currently there is no requirement mm -hmm. for a, dis a distance requirement between the, if I understand the question right, the mail location facility and HUD. So you want to review it, but currently there is not that requirement. There it's may be in, in the there. amendment. It's not in there. Okay. Okay. Right. Next question concerns um, personal identification verification. How long does it take to get it? Who in contracting staff need the PIV? In the contractor staff will need PIV. First part of it is how long does it take to get it? I can, I can take, you want me to take that? You can take it. <laughs> <laughs> right now the average PIVing process is two to four months. Um, anybody or every contractor, every contract staff has to be PIBBED since they are dealing with uh, PII, whether they are in our system or not. Okay. And this question had already been answered. Do I get today's presentation material? It will be posted. Okay, next question. Can a proposal be delivered by person? Yes, as long as they hear by the due date. You're late, yep. you're late. <laughs> <laughs> so if it's due at two o'clock, please don't show up at two o five, two o two, two o one. It's two o'clock. <laughs> okay. Next question: Is labor rates based on Service Contract Act? No. This is professional service contract. <laughs> Okay, at this, at this time, um, those are the questions that are, have been asked and briefly answered today. As I stated earlier, they will be posted and whatever we say today is not legally binding unless it's in writing. So now we'll move forward and unless anyone on the panel have any additional closing remarks to include Mr. McClure. If not, we will move over into the networking. And I want to thank you guys for coming. Uh, we really appreciate it. And as I reiterated earlier, make sure you read that solicitation. If you don't understand something, please ask a question about it and make sure that we get it on a specified time. Thank you.